Hello then, thanks for staying with us on the Join News Channel. This is The Pulse. This afternoon we're putting a spotlight on the uh, Tollwood session of the Kratom motorway, which is now turning into a very dangerous point. We'll get you the very latest and we're live there as uh, we open the conversation up uh, to find solutions to this uh, threats that we're finding on a cross highway. And also this afternoon as well, we're taking you live to East Africa, Kenya, to be precise, where the Africa Climate Change Summit is taking off. We hear the story of a 21-year-old Ghanaian student receiving uh, some huge uh, accolades and praise for her decision uh, to bring about some solutions to her peers. Uh, it's all coming up here on the program and a little later as well, Arise for Ghana. That's what we're looking at as we have a conversation with the NDC General Secretary, Fifi Fiavi Koite, who has today launched what he is calling Arise for Ghana. Uh, Top provoking conversation coming up here on The Pulse. The Pulse, as always, is brought to you by Global Communities Digni Lua Affordable Safe Sanitation. Uh, we are live on YouTube, Facebook, and at myjoyonline.com. Please stay with us. We'll bring you details of our stories shortly. Thanks for joining. And thanks for joining us on the program. Uh, we hit the roads running uh, because it was built to facilitate movement of goods and uh, people to and fro the port city of Tema. But today, as we speak, the Accra Tema motorway, uh, instead of making it easier, is now becoming a death trap. According to those who uh, have been working and leaving in uh, nearby uh, areas uh, to this very stretch, one person has indicated that uh, they've seen at least four people die in one day on that same stretch. And this afternoon, we're expanding the conversation to find possible solutions to this uh, problem on that stretch. The bigger challenge here, too, is that uh, data on the crash situations uh, that we have across the country is becoming scarce. Uh, so we've uh, had to rely heavily on an official uh, sources, uh, which we'll be bringing to you later on the show. But uh, first of all, uh, we take you live to the Tema motorway, uh, where this evening we know that uh, the rush hour will be getting underway. I would also like to hear uh, from you if you have any experiences regarding the safety issues uh, on that very stretch. Uh, let us know and share your uh, comments with us. Then we'll get to find out what your thoughts are. But the pressure is indeed intensifying on that stretch. Uh, and on the Roads and Highways Ministry to swiftly deal with the uh, decommissioned uh, toll booths that we have uh, in that area, becoming a deadly obstacle on our country's highways. This urgency stems from the tragic incident at the Accra toll booths just this Sunday, where a driver uh, and his mate, uh, we understand, are in critical condition, one losing his life instantly as the vehicle uh, that they were traveling with crashed into one of the toll booths there, also injuring. Uh, some of the passengers. Uh, that's adding to that green toll. Another incident uh, also occurred, as we know, in that location just hours uh, later, uh, leaving four others injured and individuals uh, with uh, some threatening injuries as well. So my colleague Carlos Caloni has been to the area. He's been, uh, you know, carrying out some more investigations into the happenings there and now found this report. This is the stage of the tow booth on the Accra Tema stretch of the motorway. After a four tanker plunged into it at around 5 o'clock a.m. Sunday, the driver's mate died on the spot and the driver critically injured. The next day, Monday, three persons on board this truck also suffered life threatening injuries when their truck crashed into the spiller. Some eyewitnesses recount the incident. That's a uh, light. Five o'clock a.m. We get car inside where we hear them where they come out. Uh, where we come out now, we see uh, some this one is a trailer tanker. 
we thank we get the accident. We, uh, we go come the driver. We made the die. We made the die for uh, so uh, around 11, 11 uh, 10 to 11. And we get inside too. And we hear another bound. Where we come out now, you see, say, this car to get some rest then. We, uh, the people was train inside. So we, we come away, we come out too. We put them, car, we them send them to hospital. Uh, the, by the driver, the in leg, we call, uh, listen, fire service. We can help us, we come out down. We send them to hospital. So right now, so what, this two boots. It's not working. Always absent. Me right now, I'm travel. Uh, what do you call him? Ali, Niger, Abidjan. Anywhere, I'll go there. But this accident, I've not seen before. But I'm not here alone. Always. This two boot, Temato boot, uh, what do you call Accra, uh, Weja, um, what do you call Instagram room. The same thing. I meet accident. These crashes are not limited to just the Accra Toll Plaza. Eyewitnesses claim between January and August this year, over 20 people have died in a similar way at the Tamato booth. Yes, January to August, what I've seen, I've actually witnessed over, uh, I may say 20 deaths, what I've seen. Yes, and it normally occurs at night, because normally there is no toe, uh, light on the, on the, on the toll booth uh, at night. And then also, you know, especially those who are new on the road, and when we are driving along, you know, the flower Accra road, the marginal lines in between the road that we should follow, some of them come and face to the walls of the two. So without you being new, you being rolled on the road, you wouldn't even know you are heading towards to a wall. Since there is no light or there's no any indication that, okay, this, you are approaching danger zone, or maybe there's no any reflector, nothing to show that. Uh, there is an empty tow ahead. By the time you realize, you have already driven into the tow booth. This has angered many motorists and residents who are demanding the total removal of the commission tow booth from the country's highways. My, yesterday, I was here, and my auntie called me, said, I should come and see something. Accident happened at motorway. I was running, come and see. It's very, very, very bad. Sad. Some people are dying just like that. So we beg the Kufado. We beg uh, Mr. Makwata. We beg them. They should come and remove the room so that the driver will take time and go. They are on speed. So if the two boots are smart there, they will come and go and pass three. But the, because of the room, they are losing control. So innocent person had died, stomach all tear. The, everything is the stomach was flowing like this. You can't see, that you can't see. Very sad. How this Tobu they kill human being for years, you know, if they don't feed the Pema, the Pema, they will come clear for us. Because especially the uh, Ashaman Tobu, every day we know come out here, but they four or five. But today as you, you are here, we know if you talk, but you are here, there are no say you will go out. So with the beg, with the, with the beg government of Ghana, they should come and repair the tow booth or they will clear for us. Visibility at these tow booth at night is low and there are no warning signs. Until these tow booths are either put to good use or removed, drivers will have to exercise a lot of caution when approaching any of these booths anywhere in the country. Carlos Calonis reports, Joy News. Well, there's a reason for which, uh, of course, uh, many concerns are being raised about safety, first of all, uh, for residents in the area and motorists. Uh, very bad situation there. There are also um, issues that we need to look at uh, taking the concern to the National Road Safety Authority. But first, though, uh, let's uh, get you to the area, that stretch that we're actually talking about to get, uh, you know, a live feel of the situation um, at uh, the area, uh, particularly as we know that, uh, of course, the rush hour will set in in a few minutes from now. But first, though, let's speak to the Acting Director uh, General of the National Road Safety Authority, Engineer David Safwa Donteng, is joining us uh, for a conversation this afternoon. Um, not um, a good story uh, or, you know, trajectory that we're seeing now that uh, government has decided um, to reverse its decision or policy 
on taking road tolls. But it's becoming, uh, you know, much more of a, a challenge or a danger posing threats to lots of people plying the Akrata motorway. Uh, what reports, official ones, are you receiving at your desk right now, Engineer? Uh, I heard that there's a... Sorry, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon, sir. Okay, and please, my name is Henry Asumeni. The taxi director general is engaged now, so I am representing him on this um, platform. Right, well, what, what a timely intervention that is. Uh, but, but it's good to be having you here on the polls. Uh, let's get to the concerns. The concerns are also about safety, as I was just pointing out. That stretch, especially at night, um, you know, posing lots of danger to motorists. Have you received official reports on this? Um, yes, we have received some reports, especially the whole stretch of the motorway that um, people complain about how it is um, the motorway is just sat now and how dangerous it is for people who apply on the uh, motorway. And I think from, for some time, the road authorities have brought some interventions on the main stretch of the motorway to um, uh, allow people free usage of that road out of uh, danger. But one thing that keeps coming is the uh, toll booth area where we used to have these uh, toll booths where we collect tolls, which are no more, but the, these structures are, are still there and uh, posing a lot of uh, danger. So yes, we have this and we have um, for some time now been engaging these uh, stakeholders in um, road safety, especially stakeholders who are in control of the uh, motorway. And I think uh, we have discussed a solution that very soon we will be seeing yeah. it being implemented, where we want uh, there will be more visibility. And then on the roadway itself, you know, the motorway is a two lane. But when you get to that area, it becomes, uh, because of the booth at the time, we had about uh, four to five booths there. So I think one of the solutions that have been proposed is to maintain the two lane from the beginning to the end. So in the two lane road, we would remove all, all obstacles from uh, the roadway so that people, when you start the road, you know that you are using a two lane road up to the end. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there will be a blockade off those other, um, um, to the other boots, the three or four additional boots. There. Yeah, so I see. And we're still talking, and I'm sure very soon we will be seeing okay. some some um, visible uh, activities, visible interventions okay. around the two. At, at the time, government was making the announcements that um, you know. It was reversing the policy on, on toll boots, uh, sp specifically on the Akratama motorway stretch. Uh, what exit plan did you flashing out as the National Road Safety Authority? Okay, thank you very much. You know, um, there is, apart from the rolling out of uh, the policy that we won't be collecting tolls anymore, there was also um, a policy where the motorway is going to be expanded, which is still in the roadway. We are going to, the motorway is going to be expanded. So in the interface where we'll be expanding the motorway, these would have been dealt with. But I think due to some constraints beyond uh, all the actors, mm -hmm. this uh, expansion has uh, delayed. And we need a quick intervention to prevent uh, accidents especially at these two good areas. And that is how come um, this intervention I just uh, talked about is coming at play. So, so the immediate marching whole, orders? Whole, mm -hmm. the immediate ma whole, yes, the well, immediate marching orders, is that you're closing, you're closing them down, breaking them down? What's going to happen? I guess that's all everyone is on the lookout for. Yeah, so as I said, for now, we are going to maintain the two lane. And when you get to the two boot area, the other areas will be corded off and then the two-way road where you have this, um, that where the toll booth used to stand between the first and the second lane will be taken off so that there will be no blockade on the road, both at the Accra and then at the Termine. How soon are we to expect that? Oh, I think even the uh, contractor should be mobilizing to come to site to work on this. So very soon we'll see action. We still because um, yesterday, because yesterday, all the 
major stakeholders were there to discuss this and um, even the uh, contractor himself too was there. So I'm sure um, the other panelists can give more light on this. But do, do you still uh, consider? Do, do you still consider the uh, stretch the, from Accra to Tema using that highway? Uh, do you still consider it as a, as a motorway? It's, it's it's becoming more or less um, a death trap. I, think yeah, we, I mean that, that's 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 the concern now. I mean, do you still consider okay. it to be I a think, motorway? I think we've had this discussion before, where I personally mentioned that yes. Although it is considered in the books as a motorway, its usage has been turned into a normal highway. And so even when you are using the road, although the speed limit on the road is 100 kilometers per hour, you are encouraged to not go up to even 80 kilometers per hour because now the, um, there are a lot of activities along uh, the road, such so that you should take more precaution when you are using the roads. I so think. Uh, I think we have had this conversation where we said, yes, the um, activities around the road has made the road less than um, usage of the road at speeds less than 100 yeah, kilometers per hour. I guess you're just being diplomatic now. You just don't want to <laughs> use the word as it should be, uh, that this is indeed a death trap. In fact, many people complain about the uh, uh, Kratama Okay, we shouldn't be calling it a motorway now. Henry, just hold on for us. Uh, also joining the conversation is Joseph Achu, um, uh, that, uh, Joseph Achu Amejake is the Director of Road Safety and, and, and also Environment at the Ghana Highway Authority. Um, very often, we're, we're you know, giving the backlash, all of them, to the National Road Safety Co- uh, Commission uh, or Authority, and yet we leave the Highway Authority out of the conversation. But it's instructive to note that much of the problem you see on that stretch the blame should be going to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm grateful we invited to join this program for this discussion. As you know, the motorway was built, built in the early 60s, I should think so. And I've been in service for quite some decades now. And naturally, the quality or the condition because of the AC usage is uh, the quality, the right quality is going down. But the uh, government is taking measures to provide us with money to expand the motorway, like uh, the former uh, speaker has indicated. Uh, we are also equally concerned about the speed of accidents on the highway. Uh, you will agree with me that uh, road safety is a shared responsibility. We have our role to play. Road users also have their role to play. What normally kills is the, the high average speeds that are maintained on the road. To the right quality might not be the best, but we do expect that uh, all of us as road users uh, should assess caution as we use the uh, highway. Uh, as you go on the motorway, you uh, you observe that there are some distresses on the highway. Periodically, we take steps to rectify these distresses and make sure that we put it in a condition that at least can offer satisfactory service to our users. Uh, in terms of uh, the situation at the two booths, as the, the gentleman from the road safety has indicated, yesterday we were all at the site together with the MTTD to identify what we need to do to address the situation. And I'm happy that uh, measures have been taken to ensure that we eliminate and you know, also reduce the speed or frequency or severity of accident mm. at the two booths. Like uh, the earlier speaker uh, indicated, we are going to limit movement to the two lanes specifically on the concrete section, and they will block uh, accesses to the other two books and make sure that uh, you can have a free movement through that session so that uh, at least we eliminate all the risk, uh, safety risks along that session. We think this measures if taken at least will reduce the frequency and the severity uh, of and what And what's strange in all of this is that I'm not getting a clear timeline on when all of this will happen. You, you just keep telling us about uh, well, that, that will happen. By, 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 by today is Tuesday, is that not it? Yes. But later by Thursday, the contractor should move into site. We are using our own personnel. So I think uh, uh, mobilizing the resources will not be not take quite a time for it, for resources to be mobilized. To uh, even, even with uh, about four opponents, you, you still have a, a very um, a huge traffic situation there uh, anytime you have the peak hour setting in. And now you're closing two of that. 
You, you can just imagine we were having what, what that challenge happen. when yes. they were collecting the tools. Mm -hmm. Now that we are not collecting tools, we will have a free movement along that session. Yeah, you but, know that there's no tool collection at the I, tool booth. I, I know that I know that very well. But but I'm talking about even the current situation as of the time you uh, revoked the collection of the tool, tools uh, at that very uh, point, we still have and do have very hectic uh, traffic situations there. Now you're closing two of the openings. No, we are, we are, we are, we are, the two links, the two concrete links, we are blocking the access to other uh, sections of the two book. But as you proceed from uh, the, uh, the mall and you are coming on the two links, you go straight. We are clearing all obstacles along the two links. So there's no need to gear up or divert to any other, divert your course. We just go straight. Maybe the structures along that section will be eliminated and therefore you will not be impeded. You will just go straight through it, and then we don't think uh, anybody will encounter any challenge around that. Okay, that, that sounds good. Uh, the hope is just that it, it might work. Uh, we would have to wait to see what, what you would engineer there. But beyond that, there's also the concern even about street lights. Total darkness on, on that stretch, if you move um, through the, you know, uh, Kratima motorway um, at night, you're aware of this. Okay. Measures are being taken now to not only motorway, all over the can micro sections along the highway. Measures will be taken to address all those concerns. I, I'm sorry, with, with all due respect, is, is it the case that you are now recognizing all of these challenges or, you know, you've been constrained in terms of funding, perhaps, or maybe some of them? No, you know, these quests are major ways. If you go to any country and want to know whether the country is rich, just look at their rules. Good works uh, involves a lot of money. And normally, before you are given a provider, you have to take Government, you have to seek uh, approval. So, and then estimates have been sent for approval, and we, we anticipate that very soon we'll get the approval to implement the works. Okay, uh, just hold on for us. Uh, we, we need to, uh, of course, uh, just get a live feel of what's happening uh, on that stretch as we speak. Perhaps it will inform uh, your contribution to the show as well and, and what you plan to do about what's happening uh, on, on the Akrantama motorway. Uh, but we don't want to call it a motorway now because it's obvious that it's becoming uh, a highway, more or less. Uh, Carlos Caloni, my colleague uh, with the Joy Newsroom here, is uh, stationed there looking at the situation for us now. Uh, Carlos, so what I see is the... Uh, Toll Plaza, obviously uh, painting a picture of uh, where the last unfortunate uh, accident occurred. What more is happening on that stretch uh, days after the uh, crashes? All right, Blazer. So we are currently at the Tama Toll Plaza where a number of accidents have been uh, reported. And so, as you can see in your picture there, you see this concrete, heavy concrete slabs on the road. And so when the vehicles are actually coming from a flower side towards Accra, they are actually forced to run into this concrete uh, you see because of a number of reasons. One of the reasons is that uh, there are no warning signs when you approach the toll plaza. Another reason is that the uh, marginal markings on the road uh, are forcing uh, drivers to switch lanes and most of these markings go straight into the concrete. And so according to those who have been, I mean, are around here, they've been telling us that since January up to now, they've had over 100 uh, road crashes here and they are putting the death toll to about 20 and beyond. And so we'll be speaking with a number of uh, the uh, guys who are here who are going to share their story with us, what they have seen so far, so we can really understand the situation. So you are live on Joy News. You have witnessed a number of uh, road crashes at this particular spot. What can you tell us? What have you seen? Yeah, normally uh, it happens at uh, night, mainly, because I been always, always driving on the road as well because there were instances that I nearly you know bump into some of the, 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 the concrete because it's like when you are driving towards uh, from Tema to Accra you wouldn't know that is an empty tool ahead so even if you are you are around the area you may be confusing a little bit and most of times those who have been involved in an accident here are mainly people who are new on the road because when you're driving from far, you wouldn't even know there is no any warning signs 
on the road that there is an empty or closed tow boot ahead. By the time you ri realize you have already driven into the tow. So I can say since the closure of the tow in 2022, there has actually been, what I have seen, I have actually seen more than 100 accidents. But what I have recorded, recounted, the number of deaths that I recounted may be, for me I can say I have recounted 20 deaths. And then uh, there were instances when uh, one uh, Joy FM, you know, driver, uh, sorry, um, Kasapa FM driver bombed into the, the concrete and then I rushed, rushed him to the hospital and then uh, he died, you know, uh, uh, at the spot. Yes, he died at the hospital. So it's not, not one. There was in, yeah, one instance when a uh, uh, vehicle hit into the two and then uh, the, the concrete and then the, the vehicle got caught catch fire and the occupants, I think they were some sort of Chinese or something or some Asians and they died instantly. And there were also one BNINI uh, officials, BNI officials who also bumped into it and then one of them died and the other had uh, all his legs broken and the other was in a very bad uh, critical condition. So uh, like I said, um, uh, I don't know where to put it, but I, I don't want to be political. But what I'm saying is... Um, okay, we'll, we'll look at the political anger, but then uh, paint a picture for us in the night. How does this place look like? The fact that we don't have street lights and uh, no warning signs here. Paint a picture for us. Yes, uh, at night it looked very dark. And then uh, recently, uh, three days ago, there were some, you know, electricians, you know, who tried to mount or to bring back uh, the uh, electricity on the tow. So I didn't know, but then I just got information that the uh, uh, MCE for Punkatamansu uh, drove into the tow and also involved in an accident. But so I may be sure that that was the main reason they came to mount, you know, to bring back the lights. So the question that I'm asking myself is, so must we be, so if politicians are not those involving, or maybe, let's say, for, for instance, if politicians involved in the accident much earlier, maybe they would have do something or what they should supposed to be do done earlier. Though what I have done, placing the light or bringing back the light alone is not enough. It is not enough. What uh, maybe they should do immediately is maybe by placing bombs or ram rubbles, you know, uh, on the on the road, yeah. at least, and also warning signs, you know, for so that motorists, especially those who are new on the road, will know, you know, there is a danger ahead. I am a quite social commentator myself, and then I run a page called Kwame Nkrumah TV on TikTok and on YouTube. And uh, I even made a couple of, I think since the day the tour was closed, the next day there was an accident. I made a video and then on TikTok and then, yeah. Okay, so tell us, when this accident happened, do you have any ambulance station here that takes care of these victims? No, 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 there has not been any ambulance. So what happens to the victims? What do you do to them? You know, normally that's what we do. Our culture, we are so supportive. So anytime I thought something like that happen, maybe you drive, you stop, maybe a good Samaritan may stop his vehicle so that we convey the, 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 the patient into yeah, his vehicle and then you take them to the hospital or sometimes you use a motorbike sometimes and then uh, if the, 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 the patients are not in their critical conditions, you use motorbikes sometimes conveying them to the hospital. Yeah, that's what we do. All right, thank you. So what do you want the authorities to do about this particular uh, turbo? Do you want it removed or you want it uh, uh, to be reconstructed for use? Yes, definitely uh, for them, for the, I think uh, when we the government is going to the IMF for the IMF bailout. Per the IMF's directives, you know, bringing back the tow boot was one of the mandatory advice that the IMF gifted, give, 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 gave to the government that they should bring them back because the tow was giving Ghana 10 million Ghana CD. So you have the opinion that they, they, they should bring it back? Of course, you know, uh, bringing it, but maybe if this tow was in operation, we wouldn't have gone to beg for this conditional loan that the next three generations are going to pay for the mistake we make today. All right, all right. Yes. Okay. So, like, because these are loans that we've been taking, they are slavery. Okay. Like I said, they are slave loans that we shouldn't have gone to beg them because they don't have anything that we should be begging them. You okay. understand? Okay, all right. Thank you so much. So, uh, that is somebody who lives close. Uh, to the uh, uh, Tama Tobot here and uh, he's been recounting what he has been seeing and according to him over 20 lives were lost at this particular spot. Now I want you to have a better perspective. We'll, we'll zoom into the concrete on the road so you can appreciate exactly what happens here. Now the vehicles that are moving
moving from Aflao towards the uh, Tow Plaza, they ran into some of these concrete uh, slabs, I, I'll call them, and then uh, because of bad lighting, they are uh, Sometimes they are involved in accident, and some of them, when they are coming all the way from the Aflao side, they are forced to switch the lanes, and some of these lanes run straight into the concrete slabs. And so that has been the situation. And so if you come here, you realize that this toll booth, which hitherto used to be uh, used to collect tolls for the country, they, they've all broken down. You can see where I'm standing now. You don't have one, and according to the uh, those we've been speaking to, it is as a result of the vehicles running into them. All of this, except the first two that you can see, they are all gone. And so it tells you the gravity of the situation here. Lives have been lost and they are calling on the authorities for something to be done urgently and so to protect lives and property. So, blessed, that is the picture here at the Tamato Plaza where we are reaching you from. All right, then, uh, Carlos Caloni, my, my colleague there at uh, the toll booth. Um, just uh, the opening uh, towards the uh, Crown Tamato Motorway beginning to, uh, you know, raise concerns about safety. Engineer, uh, engineer uh, Abdullahi Mahama is a civil engineer joining the conversation as well we've been speaking to the Ghana Highway Authority and the National Road Safety um, Authority but but engineer listening to the conversation it does appear that th there's just more beyond uh, issues about the concrete slabs and um, no power at night to at least provide lightning uh, lighting uh, for for that stretch and we also have a situation where uh, of course uh, uh, there's traffic congestion you know, so a myriad of challenges. I'm just wondering if we can deal with that concretely as of now. Well, uh, I'll say a good afternoon to your cherished viewers. I, I remember, um, I think, last two years, we made mention of um, drivers applying some basic ethics of driving. We are all aware of the fact that the uh, Tamamoto Way had lost a lot of its uh, features. So it's really proper that, um, I excuse me to use the word, we have to apply some common sense when we are on that particular stretch of the road. Uh, sorry to the first time users. And the first time user of any road to, when you go through your driving, you are taught to, to be aware if you are actually on a first time, uh, first time user to a particular stretch of a road. You would have to um, minimize your speech. So this is something that Joy, FN, Joy TV has sustained over the years. And once we are all aware that the motorway is in fact going to go under an, a massive reconstruction, maybe in the next few months, if not a year or less, we just have to manage what we have there. Every tow boot has what we call the speed coming measures at both approaches. I'm sure this one pair of videos I just cited have just gone down. And uh, the, the, the lack of lighting of the place in the night has contributed significantly to what is happening. But if as we hear any accident during the day, it's, it's quite amazing. In fact, I'm just being practical because I used the road about three months ago and knowing the situation on the motor, at least you, be, at least you are watching the, the road as you are driving on it, so you see what is ahead of you. And when I reasonably was speeding within 60 to 70 or 50, almost 95% of the vehicles which were on the road with me were speeding with the speed of light. Every vehicle overtook me on the highway. And we are saying that the motorway has actually outlived its desired lifespan. We see the cracks, we see all the features which have gone away. So if the drivers don't become a bit responsible to, to lift their legs up their other a bit, this wouldn't stop. Government, as we are told, is looking for money to actually reconstruct the motorway. Because you can see that there's a connect from the is it um, Trasaco area to connect to the motorway and then this uh, sprinters one coming across the motorway. So it means that phases of the project are being done so that when the motorway is finally constructed, it will connect well with the 
existing uh, road platforms from the other side. So, in as much as the um, we have suspended the two. Once we have had some of this devastation, we may just go in as a, maybe the Ghana Authority to actually remove the debris and get the fiscal payment structures up. Because actually, if you look at what is there now, about 85 to 90 percent of the fiscal structures are already gone, leaving the base concrete on the ground. So once we, there's nothing to actually um, um, get from the debris we have there, it's better we just go and get the, the ones down there mm. so that uh, we can see some nice as government plans to come in with the... The decision, uh, yeah, the, the, the decision yeah. to, um, you know, shut off the uh, two, two openings there uh, just, just to make way um, for, you know, free passage and to ensure that, you know, these kind of crashes that we see uh, along that stretch are minimized. Do you feel that that result will be achieved at the end of the day? I couldn't get the, the beginning. The, the decision by the highway authority, by the National Road Safety Authority, to try and check, you know, two openings at the toll plaza or the toll point, well, is, is that no. going to address the, the problem of the crashes that we have? Yeah, for now, once that is done, at least we're going to have uh, more space of the carriageway being uh, used by the vehicle. So those debris and those uh, few obstacles which are the base of the, the structures or to be removed like the mm. Ghana High Authority have rightly said. And I think the, the, the place will be relatively safe for uh, motorists and pedestrians alike. But we have to sustain one campaign. Mm -hmm. Like we have said this in, over the course of the years, we are all aware of the, the challenges on the motorway. Drivers ought to be responsible. I'm telling you that I use the road occasionally and I don't see any vehicle, both commercial and private, doing under 60 kilometers on the road. You have the road ahead of you, and you have seen the devastation or how the road has deteriorated. It's only basic road ethics. Lift your leg off your paddle, drive within a reasonable time, traverse that distance, and get home safe. Yeah, but to be, to be fair also to, you know, uh, these motorists, uh, it's not a, as though they're against the traffic laws. This is supposed to be a motorway, by the way. Yes. Talk less of being a highway. And I'm saying, you know, I get you, I'm saying that over the, at least let's say for the past, say, 10 years or so, this campaign, yeah. we have sustained this campaign, the media have sustained. And you, I'm saying that you obviously, you see ahead of you that mm. the road is not in a good shape. Okay. So How the about, fact that yeah. the, name, the name is a motorway doesn't necessarily mean that you have to drive beyond a certain limit. Mm. The design of the motorway was 100 kilometers per hour. And as it stands there, anyone who does beyond 70 kilometers per hour is putting his life at risk. I see. Uh, Henry, how about the, you know, the considerations along having police visibility there, MTTD stationed there just to check traffic? Okay, um, thank you very much. But um, if you have heard the news, I'm sure you have heard it being in the media circles and Ghanaians have heard it, that um, the police, MTTD is actually going fully automated and one of Hello, Henry. Uh, Henry. Henry, we lost you briefly. Uh, if you could just take that point for us again. Okay, thank you. I'm saying that I'm sure we have all heard that the MTTD is going automation. Oh, yeah. Henry, we're, we're with you. We can hear you. Mm. Uh, when they are going to install some cameras along the roads, some will be in vehicles, some will be um, used uh, fixed, and then some will be use on posts. So yes, that we could find cameras, especially the in vehicle cameras. So this is something that's Okay. It uh, looks like we're having a, a challenge. So, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Henry, sorry, Henry, no, well, we, we, we keep losing you intermittently. Uh, can you come again on the yes. point you're making? Yes, I'm saying that you're asking about police presence on the yes. Tamakra motorway. Yes, yes. And I'm saying that that is, this is one of the first roads that will be used in this uh, MTTD automation exercise that is uh, coming up. We would have in vehicle, uh, vehicle, in vehicle cameras on the Tema motorway to check speed. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll just. Uh... I, I, I did. 
Well, well, just that what would have to do then is to rework the connection to Henry, uh, that uh, Henry Asumani, uh, he's the um, Senior Planning and Programs Manager uh, for the National Road Safety Authority. Uh, we seem to be having some challenges uh, uh, with this connection there, uh, but there's a, an individual also joining the conversation. is called Anthony, and Anthony nearly had a death experience on that stretch. Anthony, uh, share your experience with us uh, just before I hear from the Highway Authority uh, as we wrap up on this conversation. Okay, um, oh, sorry, am I back? Sorry. Uh, Henry, we'll, c- we'll come back to you briefly. I just want to hear from Anthony, okay. and then uh, we'll, we'll get back to you and also uh, Mr. America on, on this issue. Yeah. Okay, so good afternoon to all your listeners. I'm Anthony, talking from Legon. And I think two weeks ago, I was coming from Michelle Camp with my brother, and then we ran into one of the concretes in front of the, the tow boots, and it resulted in the loss of my brother's life. But God being so good, I survived without a scratch, and I'm so thankful to God for that. But then the tragic incident happened, and then I lost my brother. And I think one thing that resulted in the accident was we didn't see the concrete ahead of us because the place was dark. It was when we got closer to it, and then the headlights shone on the concrete before we realized there was something in front of us. But then it was too late. Even though my brother tried to swerve it, but... We hit it and then the cars are sorted. So that is what happened. Okay, but that's, that, that was your experience at the time. Um, yeah. Are you hopeful that something will be done? And if anything should be done, what exactly are you on the lookout for? Okay, I'm very hopeful that something will be done. I think something that keeps taking lives and keeps putting lives at risk. I think the police told me that they were working on it. They had spoken to the road safety and the two boot operators to get something done about it. And so they are hoping that something will be done. And personally, I'm hopeful that something will happen because I don't wish for what happened to my brother to happen to any other Ghanaian out there because every every life is precious. So I believe that something will be done about it. Okay, and, and, for those, thing, and, and, and for those who usually go on that stretch, uh, what's the scariest point? Uh, and just paint that mental picture um, for, for, for our viewers to know about it. Okay, I think the scariest point for me was how we, could, we didn't expect what we saw because it wasn't like we were watching somewhere else, but we were just entering the road and somebody entering a new road. You can't be looking elsewhere. You tend to be focused, but then... We couldn't see what was ahead of us because the place was kind of dark at the moment. So mm. we couldn't see before we realized everything had happened already. And it happened so fast that you could, you, you can't even think about what to do. So that was the scariest part of it for me. Yeah, yeah. This must be a very traumatic experience for you, mm. uh, Anthony. Uh, but uh, Mr. Amitaki, the, the point about what the highway authority would do beyond Thursday, just uh, shutting off two entry points, uh, also trying to ensure that there's a free flow of traffic. Beyond that, what's the long-term plan and how soon will we see work begin? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and like I indicated, uh, in the interim, we took measures to ensure that uh, the two session is uh, put in a state that uh, everybody can use in a safe and efficient manner. Then uh, subsequently, uh, we are looking at expanding the capacity of the motorway. And then the government is looking for funding for us. So I should think by close of uh, this year, at least maybe in a document uh, efforts to be initiated. Mm. And thereafter, maybe by next year, some activity should commence on the motorway. But you know, we are currently working on the, beyond the motorway, we are working towards the uh, uh, at Chenya, we are dualizing the road section over there. Yeah. We are working towards the Lukankobe area. We are also working on the Ofankot, where expand, expand capacity to make sure that everybody can use our road sections in an efficient and a safe manner. Mm. And all over the country, measures have been taken to ensure that we provide Ghanaians with a safe, efficient, and a, 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 a safe, efficient, and a, a smooth road service. Right. Do it costs a lot of money. If you go to any country, like I indicated, if you look at their rules, it means that they, uh, if they have very good rules, it means that they have money. And then we are not very rich, like uh, other states, like uh, Saudi Arabia or whatever. But uh, the money that government provides for us, we make sure that we, we take steps to ensure that we provide Ghanaians, especially in strategic rules, 
if I ask you, mine have not known. Uh, we are, uh, if you take a Kumasi Accra Kumasi road, there are sections that we are bypassing to make sure that the uh, accidents that will happen on some of the sections on, along the Accra Kumasi road are also eliminated or addressed. Mm. So currently, we are trying to take measures to bypass about four communities, and that's also a massive injection of money. Okay. So we are doing our best to ensure that we provide Ghanaians with a safe, efficient, and uh, uh, Sessions. Okay, so, so you're, you're indicating to us that at least we're, we're ruling out this year, nothing will be done this year, concretely speaking. For the motorway? Mm -hmm. Expansion, possibly? Yeah. That's why I indicated that uh, the expansion, you know, it's, uh, it takes steps. You have to do the design, then go on, go on to procure the works, and then uh, we start the implementation. So the procurement measures might start this year, and then next year we might see some action on the road. To expand the capacity. Okay. So, but currently, we may take steps to make sure that the, the two road sessions are uh, put in a shape that they make them all use in a safe and efficient manner. Okay. Thank Actual you. construction may be next year, as you're indicating yes. to us. Um, okay. So, in the meantime, if that's the case, Henry, what other plans do we put up in terms of long term safety? Okay. Along the Thank you. Thank you very much. I think. Um, uh, I will first talk about the motorway. What the point I was trying to make about the police presence? I was um, saying that yes, the police is automating their uh, enforcement, and one of the areas where this automated enforcement will start is actually the Temakra motorway, where they would station an in vehicle speed and red light enforcement camera who would be checking the speeds and other behaviors of drivers on the routes. So that uh, if you are speeding excessively, you can be apprehended and, and advised or prosecuted. And this is one measure that the police is coming on board with. The, another measure is if you are um, driving on the motorway, you can see the... Um, Red Cross Emergency Center on the, the right side when you have from Accra on the motorway. If you look at it, you see that we, uh, the National Safety, together with its stakeholders in the health sector, has come up with an ambulance bay where uh, an ambulance will be stationed there for other for eventualities. In case a crash happens on the motorway, the, the people could be conveyed to the nearest uh, hospitals in due time. In the long run, as uh, the Ghana Highway Authority has said, yes, uh, there will be an expansion of the motorway to accommodate uh, more vehicles. That is increasing the number of lanes on the motorway and also uh, making the road safer. So in the long run, that is what would be done. But in the short term, as uh, Engineer Chu has described, in the short term, we are going to ensure that people remain safe on the motorway by um, making, giving better visibility and also removing blockades on the main stretch of the motorway and cordoning off the access to the other side, the other, the other two lanes outside the main sections of the motorway. Beyond the motorway, the National Road Safety Authority and its stakeholders are ensuring that roads in Ghana are safe. And I think Engineer Chu has earmarked some of the areas that the roads are being expanded or taken off towns to ensure that people remain safe on the roads. The National Road Safety Authority continues in its advocacy and campaign for road safety measures on our roads, especially the Stay Alive Road Safety Campaign. The um, Ghana Police Service, as I mentioned already, is automating its services to be able to take out, inter especially interferences, where when people are apprehended for offences, people intervene on their behalf. Mm. In the system that they are bringing on board, you cannot interfere because as soon as you are captured, the system picks the offence and the offence is registered. And nobody can uh, defend right. the Mm. Procedure for apprehension cannot be truncated at any point without reasonable, um, uh, without a reason. Because if it is truncated, it will be uh, identified as an 
um, offense that has not been redeemed yet, mm. and it will okay. still be pending. All right. So uh, interference will be um, limited. Mm. All right. And uh, the perceived corruption among the police would also come down because now you won't face the police face to face to be able to negotiate your mm. um, uh, any anyway, any time soon. Okay, so, so here's what we'll be doing. Uh, we'll be, uh, yeah, okay, I, I get the point then. Uh, we'll be wrapping up the conversation shortly, but let's get um, uh, you know some brief feedback um, from our viewers as well who have their concerns about this uh, stretch of road, and then I'll take your uh, point, uh, Joseph from the Highways Authority, and then Engineer I don't think. Uh, uh, we have a call already. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the polls. Your name and where you're calling us from? Prosper. Okay, hi, Prosper. Hi, so I live in Tema and uh, I use the motorway very frequent. And uh, my wife also uses the motorway frequent. A um, couple of months back, there was an accident just right in front of me. And I noticed that the driver didn't know the route. So this car somehow sorted. There was an elderly woman. I was ahead, but I saw what happened. The car somehow sorted, so I had to just reverse back. We got there, her whole hand was off. Even trying to get uh, to the ambulance, it didn't work. We had to carry her into this car they call Abusu Kaimachi to transport her to the office. You see, all the beautiful things we are talking about, I hear all the beautiful English that is being spoken on, on, on TV now. It is not practical. Look, let's get the fake those portholes. Let, how much does it cost to get a reflector to put beneath those pavement blocks? We have reflectors that you can put there, which eliminate when there is, there, is, there, is, there, is, there is darkness, and all those things can prevent some of the things we are talking about. The last time I told my wife, if the, if the motor is not fixed, she went in a hospital in, in, in East Legon. I told her, she's a government worker. I told her, if the motor is not fixed, I'm not going to allow her to go to work again, because I see the kind of danger she goes through driving every day from Accra to Tema and back, and she's not the only one. Why can't we get reflected and put on these pavement things that we make in the night? How much does it cost? I can I can fully fund it. If the road safety or whichever authority is responsible, we can't get it. Please, I'll give up my number. I'll buy it and give it to them free. You are killing innocent people for nothing. Mm. Okay. How much does it cost to get those reflected? How much does it cost to to to, to make sure those portals are 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 filled up? I mean, let's, let's be practical with ourselves. Okay. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, 0302 uh, Just give us a call. Uh, let's uh, hear you out and uh, see what your concerns are. Uh, as we wait for the next call, uh, Joseph, the point about um, the street lights, how soon are you fixing dealing with that? Um, and, and what would be your concluding comments on that? The, the immediate step is to make sure that the uh, Along the two group session, we face uh, the solar traffic lights. So we want to provide about uh, 20 to 12 to 20 street lights, solar powered street lights along the two group session. And the uh, last caller just mentioned about the uh, reflective uh, tips or reflected that should have been placed on uh, the two books. And then uh, this, uh, we, about two weeks ago, we take some. This, as you can see, this is the estate that I have in my office. It's not that action has not been taken. Okay. We bought a lot of them, we fixed them on the on the, the concrete and then the two yeah. in the test of my office. Mm. So so we, we want to appeal to all business that uh, we should use the our the eyes uh, mm. safely. They might use it in a safe manner. Okay. Like I indicated the road safety is a shared responsibility. We mm. have our role to play, road users also have their role to play. Yeah. If you even build the, the very Best rules for them, and they don't use it in a safe manner. We still have accidents. Okay, so uh, let's we hear from. To everybody. Mm, 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 I see. Uh, so let's hear from Edwin, uh, Edwin, who's uh, also joining the conversation from Kaneshi. Uh, Edwin. Yeah, Edwin, I'm calling from Kaneshi. Right. Yes, uh, I'm. Uh, I do. I do. I'm into construction, so I used to use the road uh, quite some a lot of times. Actually, I nearly had an accident there, so. Since then, I started to use the Nungwa side of things. But my, my, my issue is, is very, very simple. I mean, I'm sure you, you, you have talked to engineers and those into construction. Why are they using the wrong materials to fill the portals on the, on the motorway? 
Why are they using the wrong material? You know, they use bitumen, if I'm not mistaken. They use bitumen or whatever it is. And then when the sun, when the sun, uh, when the sun shines, then it, it melts. Then it creates some kind of depression on, uh, on, the, on the street. So why aren't they all this money that they have? Why can't they use the right material to fill the road? And let the road, if it's concrete, let them use concrete. You understand what I'm saying? That's my, my issue. Mm. Okay, uh, thank you, Adrian, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, engineer, I don't think. Uh, so sorry, as I said, uh, uh, Mama, sorry, sorry, yes, yes, sorry. Okay. Is it Henry or Henry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Engineer Mama, so sorry, apologies for that. Yeah. Yeah. So whatever the GH engineer has stated, if uh, it uh, is done within the shortest possible time, that is the practical solution to the problem. Like you said, you can see from the video that you were showing that there were reflectors at the base mm. of the of the, the stru structures. And secondly, the, the caller who just finished, who just called in, um, he was talking about the asphalt being used for the repair works and that it melts. It's just that the asphalt is a flexible pavement and then the concrete is a rigid pavement. So it's just a deflection of the, the load that goes onto the asphalt that you see. It's not like the, the temperature of the environment is the one which is melting the asphalt but that is used it's not the wrong material to use asphalt to address it it's just that it's because we are dealing with a short a smaller area that's why we are having it otherwise if you look at all the bridges in the country all the vehicular bridges on top of the bridge even though there's a concrete there's still an asphalt layer on it it's just that if you are dealing with a wider area they will have the spillage that you will see on the motor area as he was alluding. So I think that if the GTA addresses what they have said, we, that's a possible solution. First, getting the lights to function in the, at the approaches of the bridge. Secondly, if the GT knows that the construction will come in in the nearest, uh, I mean the near, I mean the shortest possible time, and it may come in before the the reconstruct or the the laws will be. Uh, it, I don't know whether they pass for the boot, the tool boot to come back into operation. Then they might as well just remove the. And the structures there because of the expansion, the possible mm -hmm. expansion that will come to um, improve yeah. the quality of the food that we have. Okay. Uh, some more comments we have uh, on the WhatsApp platform. Does it mean that Ghana has not planned for this road over the period? I think we need to be proactive and uh, foresight must come through in leading this country. That's from Viglo, who's uh, also watching. Uh, this one is asking the question, did the highway director of uh, safety foresee some of these accidents? What actions uh, were taking, and uh, it's also one of the uh, comments coming through uh, from a, a viewer uh, listening to us uh, and viewing us uh, somewhere around Tema. Uh, maybe that's to Joseph, and uh, we also have the very final one here indicating that the road minister uh, should be arrested for the mess and be questioned for all of these tragedies. Uh, that's coming through from one of our viewers as well. Uh, thank you all for sending your message. Uh, Henry, you want to touch on that as we wrap up? Uh, okay, thank you very much. As, as a wrap-up, I wanted to say that, as uh, Engineer Chu said, road safety is a shared and collective responsibility, and road safety starts with you. So as we all use the motorway, we should take uh, caution because of the, of the environment we find ourselves in. So let us try as much as possible to use the motorway cautiously, but authorities are also doing their best to make the Temakra motorway safe for all who would use the roads. So as I said, we would soon be having police presence and then very soon to the ambulance will be uh, fully working on the motorway. The bay is completed and an ambulance will soon be allocated to the motorway. Mm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, Evans is wrapping up saying that uh, the motorway needs to be fixed. That's the message you're sending across on uh, WhatsApp as well. But thank you all uh, for joining the conversation. We're uh, also looking at matters relating to uh, what's happening this week at the Africa Climate Change Summit. It's taking off already in uh, East Africa, Kenya to be precise. There's a story of a 21-year-old Ghanaian student who will tell you about when we get back from this break. You're on the pulse. Please stay.
artificial intelligence, creativity, and sustainability. Join this year's Africa Rising Six, brought to you by the International Advertising Association, IAA, at the Kempinski Hotel, Gold Coast City, as we uncover the power of building future-ready brands on 5th and 6th September. Speaker Sasan Saidi, World Chairman and President, International Advertising Association, Andrew Techiapia, Co-Founder and MD, ZPay, Letepu Machaba, Independent Business Leader, Former Vice President of Home Care, Unilever, Ivan Moroki, CEO Kanta South Africa, Guy Parker, Chief Executive, Advertising Standards Authority, United Kingdom, Steve Papaiko, CEO, Extreme Ideas, Sami Awuku, Director General, National Lottery Authority, and many more. This conference is sponsored by Margins Group, ZPay, Google, MTN, Goyle, and NLA, Media Partners, CNN, Media General, The Multimedia Group, Graphic Communication Group, City TV, and City 97.3 FM. Register now at www.africarising.iaaglobal.org for more information or contact Nanajwa on 0242-528-431 or the AAG Secretariat 0244-440477. TV, all the goals, clashes, and moments. All of Rashford, Salah, and Saka. The start is getting better and better. All in the language of your choice, all in HD. Available on all these bouquets to choose from, to watch on all these devices. Get DSTV with an HD decoder plus one month compact for 299 CDs. It's the Premier League, all on DSTV. Have you uh, back with us here on the poll? So, the first Africa climate summit uh, is already underway in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, the summit, amongst other things, will be seeking to drive the green growth and climate finance uh, solutions for Africa and the world. It will also serve as a conduit for the continent to mobilize uh, some sort of action uh, in the lead up to the UN Climate Change Conference, uh, which is happening. Um, in Dubai this year, the summit is also taking place at the time where 7 uh, million people in Africa have begun to display. Uh, they are already being displaced by natural disasters, even though the continent can only account for less than 4% of CO2 emissions from fossil fuel. Ghana's youth-driven NGO, the Youth Bridge Foundation, is leading a 20-member group uh, from five African countries to attend the summit. Joyce Jami is the program's Manager joining us via Zoom now for uh, more on what's happening in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, thank you for spending some time with us. Uh, the highlights of the engagement we know uh, with the Kenyan president himself, Ruto, opening the summit yesterday. Key on the agenda issues of uh, what's happening to Africa in terms of the displacement and the effects of uh, the emissions around the world. Uh, what's been your takeaway and the lesson so far from, from the perspective of the Youth Bridge Foundation? Thank you very much, and then a very good evening to you, listeners, uh, and all those watching us. So, um, since yesterday, there's, there's been an engagement on how, as Africans, we can couch our knowledge in terms of changing some of the narratives that um, we have concerning climate change, how Africans experience climate change. And also, there's been conversations around financing the infrastructure and systems that, as Africans, we need to mitigate and also adapt to climate change. So, for um, us at Youth Bridge, uh, it's imperative that uh, young people are part of these spaces in discussing uh, what is of concern to us. So, as you already know, um, 
earlier we had participated in the African Youth Assembly, and then that was a, a, a huge platform that I think the summit um, had facilitated in making sure that young people were given the platform to discuss among themselves and also couch a narrative that um, the head of state, uh, I mean, who will be participating in this summit would consider in coming to conclusions ahead of COP28. So for us, it's been very um, engaging. And then as you know... Uh, uh, um, looks like we're having some challenge there. If, if you can hear me, the point also about uh, your participation this year in the summit, um, you're, you're there together with a team of other uh, individuals there. That, just tell us about you know, the message you're sending across from Ghana into you know, uh, this conference as you engage other stakeholders. What, what would that be? For us, one of the key messages we, were, uh, we wanted to bring across and then we've been able to highlight in all the platforms that we've been part of is the fact that there is a need for African government to pay attention to indigenous young people. So um, for us, we managed to mobilize young people across five African countries to participate in the youth summit as well as the main summit itself. So what we are driving across is the fact that there are nature-based solutions that we need to embrace in trying to mitigate and adapt to climate change as Africans. So uh, of all the countries that we are bringing the young people from, these young people have initiated nature-based solutions that they are supporting in their various communities to make sure that climate change does not really affect the community people as it has to be. So this is the message that is sending across that yes, climate uh, nature-based solutions are the alternative for sustainable climate actions. Okay, and we know that there's also a 21-year-old who's part of the delegation this year, uh, making some strides already. What's the story of this young girl? Okay, so um, as I mentioned, it's high time African states and uh, uh, governments pay attention to young people. And then for us as the Foundation, one of the critical things that we are uh, particular about is facilitating the safety for young people from indigenous communities to contribute to policy making. So um, we had initiated a project called the Diapa Youth uh, Reforestation Project in Boko. And then what the project sought to do is to mobilize young people to plant medicinal seedlings on a uh, degraded land. So when the opportunity came for us to participate in the African climate week, we thought it wise to bring someone from the community, the person who has been uh, spearheading the project in Boko, to one, experience the processes that um, are critical in shaping policies that will affect their life, that will affect the people that climate change affects. So uh, we brought uh, one list in the AFO from Boko where the project, the Japa project is being um, piloted. And then uh, she's been with us and most of the spaces that we go to, we make sure that yes, even though it's YBF, it's, um, uh, as the project lead, I'm the one supposed to speak on certain issues. She is on the field and she has been uh, spearheading the project back in Boko. So it's important she's also part of the initiative that we are doing, even on a regional level. So yes, Lucinda is here with me. If you are interested in talking to her, I can put her on. Okay, uh, we'll get to that shortly. Uh, the conversations about policy and, and issues that are relating to, you know, some of the urgent government commitments that are needed to address, for instance, uh, issues surrounding uh, plastics and other pollutants that have also come up. What, what position are you taking on this uh, and, and what recommendations are you making to African governments on specifically starting off with the issue of plastics because it's becoming big um, at, at this conference? Okay, so uh, when it comes to the issue of plastics, it's unfortunate that um, most of the, the services that we provide in Africa, most of the, in terms of food and other things, um, is use uh we use the plastic and then we don't even have the as i stated earlier on one of the things africa is fighting in terms of the uh, the climate canker is the infrastructure to make sure that we are able to mitigate and adapt so um some of the things we we, we share and also recommend to the spaces that we do is that is, is the need to create awareness on the 
canker that these plastics are causing uh, in terms of climate change. So there is a need for awareness creation on how we can um, uh, recycle these plastics and also how, if possible, we limit the usage of these plastics so that we don't have uh, the huge part of them that we, we are mm. facing now in most okay. I see. Thank you so much for joining us. But if there's a message from you and Luc uh, Lucinda uh, to the world and to African governments, may maybe you should share the platform now and uh, send that message across. What will be that message? Okay, so for me, I, I think the message that we've been sending across and then we're going to repeat is the fact that young indigenous youth matter and then we experience climate change in a different way. So it's high time that uh, governments offer us spaces, offer us inclusive responses for us to be uh, able to uh, recommend how they can solve our climate concerns. Mm. And Lucinda, for you? Lucinda. Uh, um, Lucinda, I hope you can hear me. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely, uh, it appears that we've lost, we've lost uh, them there. Uh, okay, Lucinda is here with us. Yes, your message, briefly. Okay, uh, we're having challenges hearing uh, Lucinda. Unfortunately, we have to, uh, you know, uh, go down on that. But it's... Uh, very inspiring to know that a 21-year-old is also making some strides there. Thank you uh, for joining us in this whole conversation. The National Democratic Congress's uh, General Secretary, Fifi Fiafi Koite, has uh, introduced what he terms as a rise for Ghana series. Well, this is a thought-provoking uh, online episode, a uh, short broadcast aimed at addressing critical issues uh, relating to leadership, governance, uh, values, attitude, and also actions that shape national development. In the inaugural episode, Fifi Fiavi Kweite made a call on Ghanaians, uh, starting with the NDC citizens to arise for Ghana and you know, uh, embrace the weighty responsibility of nation building. Uh, we hear from, of course, uh, the General Secretary shortly on this. Uh, before, though, uh, we take a look at the first episode of uh, the Arise for Ghana series. <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Arise for Ghana series. Uh, this is a series meant to uh, speak to all patriots of the land. Uh, Arise for Ghana stands for the very first uh, words of the NDC anthem. So this is actually a series to make a call on a weekly basis to all patriots of the land. Uh, starting with the members of the NDC and through the members of the NDC reaching out to all Ghanaians, even including MPP people, calling on them to arise for the nation and become much more patriotic for the nation. Uh, the NDC terms not only call for people to arise, they actually cause people to arise for Ghana, patriots of the land. It tells you that's a party whose main concern is to raise people who love this country, who are patriotic, who put this country first. So this series is going to be one that on a weekly basis will be touching on, will be looking at different aspects uh, in terms of raising the consciousness of our people, making us love our country more, become much more dedicated to our nation. The very first for today is start with a call to arise for Ghana. Now what we are asking for here is simple. Uh, it's a nation that has reached a cross, crossroads, a nation that is calling on all its children to think about our situation. That situation is calling for a new leadership, a leadership that will be concerned about the well-being of the country, a leadership that is aware that the youth of the country are losing hope in the political establishment. And that has come about because of breaking of promises, a policy that is and just about power for the sake of power. Politics that's not looking at the well-being of a nation, not thinking about the future of our children. NDC wants to rise to the next level, a level where politics is not just be for convenient grabbing of power. The politics is concerned about having leaders that can be trustworthy, leaders who can be relied upon to put 
the well-being and the interests of the people of Ghana as, as number one. We were the first party in the Fourth Republic, formed on 10th June 1992, way ahead of the NPP. And when we were formed, we came up with this anthem that said, Arise, arise for Ghana, all patriots of the land. We are the real patriotic people. We are the people who love this country. And if there is any group that has to rise in this moment of the darkness that's engulfing our country, this is the NDC. So this is a call to you, millions of supporters out there. That's the moment for you to rise to the responsibility that Ghana is calling for. Okay, uh, so that's the General Secretary of the NDC, Fifi Fiavi Kwete, joining us via Zoom uh, also now uh, to have a conversation on this. Uh, nostalgic feelings for those who've uh, followed your political career uh, reminds them of setting the record straight. Uh, what, what's different now that you're, you know, changing nomenclature for some and going in for a rise for change? Are you bringing the same uh, energy on or perhaps something new? Uh, hello, sir. I hope you can hear us. And if you can unmute so we can get the point. Yes, yes. okay. Yes, loud and clear. I think, I, ho I hope it's okay now. It's loud and clear, sir. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, I want to use the opportunity to greet all your many viewers uh, uh, in Ghana and beyond the country. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to uh, interact with your uh, wonderful channel uh, this afternoon. Uh, to your question, uh, I would say uh, a rise for Ghana, as I rightly indicated, is uh, the very first line of the anthem of the NDC. Uh, so if anything at all, that should be the very primordial uh, call that the NDC should be making. Uh, because that really is uh, essentially who we are. Uh, and the fact that we, we transcend just a political party. Uh, we are a group that believes that the number one thing should be the country. And uh, in where it is we have reached today as a country, uh, there's no greater call that is necessary now than a call for us to rise uh, in order to see how this country can be salvaged, in order to rise to the new challenges that confront us, in order to give new hope uh, to especially uh, the young generation of our country, and not just the Ghana, but all of Africa, who are beginning to lose hope in the whole, whole political uh, uh, journey, especially the whole democratic journey. And I'm sure you are aware of what is happening all over the sub-region, and even now going into Central Africa. So it's almost becoming difficult. across the continent now, where people are losing. And there's a need for us who find ourselves leading political parties to start rising uh, to a whole new challenge and also being able to take the country along. So this uh, series, Arise for Ghana series, uh, is in that direction. Uh, it's uh, literally emphasizing uh, the very core spirit of the NDC and also reaching even beyond the NDC to all patriots of the land. Actually, even reaching across even to the MPP and calling on MPP, now listen, this is the moment for us to rise to the higher level for the sake of our country, to rise, out, to rise from the mediocrity and move into a competition that can become a much more excellent competition, to move to a place where the concern is not how to destroy each other or how when you take power, you, you destroy every institution or every, every, every institution of the country just so that you can consolidate yourself, or how you can pervert and corrupt institutions, or how you can destroy the businesses of your opponents, all in a desperate effort to think that that's the only way you can survive. Then we should take, we should go to the next level, where the concern is about what solutions can be brought, what levels of creativity we can bring on board, what, what, what you call levels of genuine values, principles, where character becomes central to what we do. So 
uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a time to mm. move into that next direction. Right. And then you want to be mm. the party to lead that. Uh, how do you respond to critics who say that if there should be a cause or a call for patriotism, it should not be coming from you know, an opposition political party, the largest NDC, uh, which is lacing its boots to come into power. Some say this may simply be reduced to a partisan exercise. How different will a rise for Ghana be in, in, that, in that context? It will be different uh, in one in one respect. Um, it's not just going to be uh, the typical NDC is good, MPP is bad. That's not what it's going to be. It's going to make calls even upon NDC. It's going to call on us as a party to have a proper review of our own journey and to acknowledge certain things that we could have done better. And to tell our people that we are not perfect, we need to make effort to become perfect. Because Ghana is not just interested in just NDC is good, NDC is bad, MPP is bad kind of narrative. Ghana simply want the two parties to rise to levels of excellence that no matter who is in power, the country is better off for it. So we are going to be challenging our own selves. But of course, we are also going to be calling out on our opponents because we feel there are things that they clearly have to do much, much better, especially now that they have, they are in charge of the destiny of our country. They are managing the resources of the country. They are the custodians who are directly in charge of, of, of the things that are happening to our country. So naturally, we will make those calls when we've got to make them. But at the same time, we will be calling upon ourselves as well to be able to do better. Because as I indicated in this very first episode, the youth of our country are, are beginning to lose hope. hope. And they are beginning to lose it because somehow they are thinking that all the political parties effectively are the same. Seeing, for example, the pervasive, uh, shall I call it, uh, uh, breaking of promises that has happened, especially under the tenure of Nana Kufad over the last seven plus years, naturally, these youths are becoming increasingly disappointed, seeing the kind of uh, difficulties that this economy and the country as a whole has been plunged into, this pervasive loss of hope. So this is not just going to be one that we say, we are perfect, we haven't done anything wrong, or we never do anything wrong, no. We're going to shine the light upon ourselves as well and say, listen, we can do better, mm-hmm. while at the same time calling on our opponent to uh, be able to also it, rise up. Yeah, and I guess if this is boiling down to, um, you know, the economic be- performance of the country, and the president is the first to admit that there are challenges, uh, just that the... And uh, last weekend's or last two weekend's uh, exercise by the NPP to choose a new leader, the president is confident that the nation will reflect and then choose a leader that will get us out of the, the you know, challenge that we were facing. It appears the president is on your side on this. So is there any need for, to remind perhaps government of, of their responsibility? You know, uh, uh, in truth, in truth, what arise for Ghana will be doing also is to is to call on the political establishment to show much more candor, much more truthfulness. Now, the president has still not been able to have the moral courage to accept that the bulk of the problem we have in our economy today came because of his economic mismanagement. That out of that himself and his vice, who Today is looking like the, the, the front runner as far as the race in the MPP is concerned. The two of them single handedly have been the major reason why we are in the difficulty we have. They have not had the courage to accept that. They still continue to deceive the country that the real problem has come from COVID in Russia and Ukraine. That again is a problem. Arise for Ghana is saying the politics of deception must be over. The courage to accept responsibility should be the new way to go. Nobody is expecting perfection from leaders. But leaders have to be able to show to the country that when it is we get it wrong, we must have the courage to say, you know what, I got this wrong, and I should be able to do better. But it's almost as if there's such moral cowardice. People do not have the courage to say, you know what, I've got this wrong. I can do better. They simply can't do that. Even athletes, athletes have the capacity to say, you know what, this game, I didn't play well. I should have done better. I should have passed the ball better. I could have scored this one better. Or I should have caught this ball better. Even athletes have that. And people who are in charge of destiny of a nation lack the moral capacity to accept responsibility 
a thing that you can continue deceiving a country that the real problem has to do with covering a Russia and Ukraine, thinking that the millions of Ghanaians do not have the capacity to know that you are lying. That, again, is some of the issues that, that arise for Ghana will be raising. I said, gone are the days when you think you can fool the people by lying to them. We need to now have leadership that has the moral capacity to tell the truth. And once you start telling the truth, you are capable to bring the country with you. You are able to mobilize people with you because they appreciate that you are not lying to them. So that is one of the things that arise for Ghana will be mm. going into. We'll be delving a yeah. lot more into all what I consider to be character defects that should not be part of leadership. We are not asking for perfect people. We are not asking for angels. Both NDC and PP are made up of humans, and therefore there will be imperfections. But there are certain minimum requirements that both parties must not tolerate. Mm, and we'll be highlighting a lot of them. Well, uh, it's just starting. Uh, we wait to see what the next um, address will be. Uh, but, but also within your political party, Sam, say that you have quite a lot on your plate as the general secretary. Um, your party is also running other uh, programs uh, similar to news conferences addressing matters of national importance. Are you up to the task? Yes, of course, as you know, I mean, we, we have um, a lot to do, a lot to do. As we are preparing, for example, to move into a uh, limited registration exercise, that's going to be a very massive exercise. We are having our issues with the Electoral Commission, so we haven't completely uh, 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 resolved some of those issues. We think, for example, that that's one institution, for example, that, uh, and again, Arise for Ghana, we'll be talking a lot about some of these institutions that effectively become perfected institutions. Institutions that are simply, I mean, institutions that think that their job is simply to, to become appendages of the ruling party do things that will make the ruling party happy. No, your job is to do professional job. You are here for the states, not for any political party. And we'll be calling on some of these institutions to have to do what is right. And NDC will be expecting that if we are in power, we expect institutions to do what is right as well. That's the only way we are going to be making the progress that this country requires, where people will appreciate that they are not placed there to become servant to a political party, but they are placed there first and foremost to make sure the interests of the millions of Ghanaians continue to be safeguarded and also generation some bomb. Mm, okay, this sounds like a, a national exercise. Let's see if you'd maintain that. Fifi Fiavikwete, thank you for spending some time with us thank you. here on the Joy News Channel. Uh, he's the uh, General Secretary of the uh, Largest Opposition Party, the National Democratic Congress. And uh, So that's it for Arise for Change, but there are growing concerns also about the increasing number of uh, homeless children and uh, women struggling in the national capital. According to the Gender Ministry, there is an estimated 50,000 homeless persons in the country. CEO and founder of the Team CSR, uh, that Jonathan Ikema, believes that more needs to be done to provide a safety net for the vulnerable in society. He made the call uh, when his foundation visited the Porter's Village shelter at Dodua here in Accra. Providing a safety net for the vulnerable in Ghana has become an albatross in the neck of successive governments. Loitering on the streets by homeless children in the national capital is commonplace. While successive governments have initiated interventions to deal with the situation, it seems to have made little impact in getting the children off the streets. Speaking at a ceremony to present educational material to children at the Porter's Village Shelter for battered women, and children at Dodua, founder of the Team CSR Ghana, Jonathan Ikama, called on corporate Ghana and public spirited individuals to assist government and homelessness in the country. It's a major, major problem, and I know you know we depend so much on the government, but the government can't do everything. Um, we, as individuals, as corporations especially, need to stand up and help facilities such as this be able to grow and have the capacity to help more. And so we're hoping that again, corporations will will uh, stand up. We're hoping that through the diaspora system, more will come back and build even facilities like this. We need another shelter for battered women and children. The organization donated laptops, books, school bags, stationaries, and commissioned a mechanized borehole at a cost of 70,000 Ghana CDs. Mr. Ekuyamwa believes the gesture will go a long way to ease the burden on the shelter. Uh, school is about to start again. We're starting the new uh, school semester in about another two, three weeks. So we wanted to make sure that these kids 
are prepared for the new school year. And so I think these laptops will go a long way to helping them be prepared. I think the book bags will go a long way to helping them uh, carry their books and items to school. And so um, education is important, and our kids are important. And so that's why we came here today to do this presentation. Director of Potter's Village Shelter for Parted Women and Children, Nanama Edu Owusu, who received the item, expressed gratitude to the organization while calling for more support, especially in the completion of an ongoing accommodation facility at the village in order to create a conducive environment for nurturing children to become responsible citizens. Today we are blessed to have Team CSR and Mr. Jonathan Ekwamwa together with the Sigma Gamma Ru visit the Porters Village to make a beautiful donation. We saw laptops, we saw books, stationery, and we are so excited because in my previous uh, statement I was saying that here we school our children here from the preschool to grade 6 and then when they move to GHS they go to the community. But unfortunately because we do not have access to laptops for example, when we are doing our ICT lessons, we write on boards. I don't know how we can use the theory on boards to teach these children effectively. So the donation of the laptop is such a great relief to us, and we are so grateful, we are thankful to them, Team CSR, for, I mean, consistently, they've been here linking us to ball hole, someone to do the ball hole for us, bringing this donation. Sometimes they bring in people here to do lunch for the children, and we are thankful to them. But one of the major challenges now, are the, for now, has to do with our ongoing projects. They are not and we need support in terms of building materials. I said earlier too that there are people who don't believe the credibility of organizations. Our case is different. If you come here, if you visit us at the Potters Village, you will see that ours is different because everything we receive goes into the children, into our project, into paying of staff, everything it shows directly. So if we get the support in terms of building materials, if you are not sure, don't bother, don't bring the money. Buy the building materials and tell us, I want you to put it in, for example, the girls' dormitory. You will come and Well, that's all we have for you in the sparkage of the polls. I am blessed to so go and log on to myjoyonline.com. They have lots of stories there for you. Bye-bye for now.